God hasn't spoken, and they like, are you for real? <laughs> I mean, for real, you do not you know. At the venue, you like, hold on. I am at the venue, and I had no clue. Welcome to the Build on Beauty podcast, where beauty is born skin deep. Now, here's your host, author, speaker, entrepreneur, Cornell Germain. report because they say yes truly surely the land does flow with milk and honey and surely it is everything that you said it was supposed to be God but there's giants in the land and because it's giants in the land they say we can't do it now I already said I'm gonna give it to you I just said go check it out and you said you can't do it why because we like grasshoppers are there any grasshoppers in here? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, are you a grasshopper? Or are you a giant killer? Tell somebody, I'm a giant killer today. If God said I can have it, I'm going up after it. Yeah, I see the giants. I see your big head over there. I see you throwing out your stuff. Somebody got to be strong and of good courage. I like Joshua because Joshua say, yeah, true that, true that, true that. Yeah, they over there, but we well able to go up and conquer. God showed it to me. If God promised it to me, I'm going after it. Thank you all for joining me. I have a special guest. She is a preacher's preacher. One of my favorites, might I add. She is a mother in the faith, founding pastor of House of Prayer and Praise Ministries in Detroit, Michigan, and a beautiful woman of God that I love and admire. Please help me welcome author of A Joyful Journey, Pastor Valerie Bennett. Pastor Val, thank you so much for joining me. It's an honor to be here. Yes, yes, yes. I'm so happy to have you. Uh, we're in your beautiful office, which is so fit for a queen. I mean, I just love <laughs> the, the decor. It's look like something out of the magazine, you guys. I mean, I'm just telling you. You're the founding pastor, House of Prayer and Praise, uh, mother of many in the faith, and the, the daughter of a bishop. Early on in your uh, Christianity, uh, what was your idea growing up as uh, the daughter of a bishop? What was your idea of Christianity? Well, as a child, it was all I knew um, coming up in, in the home uh, with godly principles, uh, Sunday school, Bible study, church every week, and uh, went over grandma's house and everybody talked church and grandma, you know, wouldn't let us play cards on Sunday. And it, it was just really strict and, and, and rigorous. But then at, at an age when I went to uh, middle school, is when I really found a relationship with God. And on that Easter Sunday, I went up and I was baptized wow. and I gave my life uh, to the Lord. And I really wanted to draw closer and not just go to church because mom and dad went to church and that's what the family did. But I was really seeking an individual relationship with Christ yes. for myself. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So you're in church and the pastor calls up for uh, baptism. What, what did you think was going to be the outcome? Like after I get baptized, I'm a, everything going to be good? Like, I really you? did. I, I don't know if I thought the heavens were going to open <laughs> and, you know, I would just, just be in this other place. But I didn't know what to do. I found myself kind of lost mm. because... Uh, the preacher would preach to get you to this point, And then I didn't know what to do. So that Monday, I'm like, so what do I do now? Do I read my Bible more? Uh, so I just sat on the porch with my Bible. <laughs> <laughs> and I would try to read and try to become more spiritual. And I realized that that's, it, it, it wasn't that. It was a true relationship. Yeah. And I had to relax and just learn to enjoy everyday life walking with Christ. Wow. So you, you have that moment and you grow in God and then mm -hmm. you become a pastor yourself. Was that something you saw for yourself? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think after giving my life to the Lord and, and some things that I experienced in church, like ah, I, I wasn't so sure about that part. I mm -hmm. wanted to go to heaven. Yes. I, I was sure about that. But as far as preaching and serving in the church uh, this way, no, uh, actually, I didn't want to be married to a preacher. Mm. Uh, I grew up in it all of my life, and I met this man 
that was the most wonderful man that I had knew. <laughs> and they called him Freaky Steve. And I just <laughs> fell in love. <laughs> I fell in love with him. And, and my family felt he was a heathen. And his church, his family didn't go to church. And what are you doing? You're getting married. And my life changed. And I did. I became his wife. Wow. And um the amazing thing about God is God still saves sinners. Yeah. And yeah. so we did get married. We just got married at the house. Nothing big, nothing fancy. And then he gave his life to the Lord. Uh-oh. And when he, <laughs> he, we were at the cabaret just partying, having a wonderful time. And he said, I'm going to church tomorrow. And I said, sure, that's the liquor talking. Mm -hmm. And no, the next morning he woke up went to church, they baptized him that day, and he became a born-again believer. And so our marriage changed. Our relationship began to change. And I said, I messed up because <laughs> I didn't want to marry a preacher. <laughs> and, and now he, he gave his life to the Lord, excited about Jesus, felt the call of God on his life, wow. and uh, he accepted it. And then we birth House of Prayer and Praise. Oh, and wow. you say, here we go. <laughs> here we go. But it's the best thing that could have ever happened to me. Wow. You know, sometimes we don't want to marry a preacher and certain mm. things we don't want. But as we run away from God, we're running back into his will. Mm. Yes, right yes. where he would have us to be. Because had I known he was a preacher when I met him, I wouldn't have been married running. him. <laughs> <You've been running. laughs> but I surrendered. We got married and uh, we were able to do ministry together. Wow. And our hearts joined in love. And then our assignments joined with destiny of what God had planned just for us. Wow. Well, you're, you're the oldest of six. And I'm curious. I know uh, a lot of... Um, pastors that have children, they always have the one or maybe sometimes multiple uh, that they just know is going to be. Was that you or was that it was it your, one of your brothers or sisters? I think if you ask my dad, he might say that, yes, he knew, because once I got baptized young, I followed him to church. And so not the other children, my brothers and sisters, uh, they really didn't go. But wherever he went, you know, I'm like, Dad, I'm going with you. So I would ride shotgun. And my dad was a musician, too. So he would play. And I'd just be in the congregation at the visiting churches all by myself. And I would go from church to church. On Good Friday, he would fast. And I would fast with them and make sure we went to all the services. So I just had this heart after God's own heart. And um, But, you know, sometimes when you're raised in it, when you grow up, you want to know What's on the other side, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's when I, I, I met my my husband. It was like, whoa, let's find out what this is all about. <laughs> and it wasn't everything I, it was cracked up to be yeah. to me. Because yeah. sometimes as a PK, you can feel like you're missing out mm -hmm. because you church, church, church. But the things that I was missing did not even measure up to the things that I gained when I accepted Christ. So it was just such a beautiful, beautiful life. I wouldn't trade it for nothing. Wow, wow. Now you mentioned pastoring uh, with your late husband, Bishop Stephen Bennett, who we all love and admire. Uh -huh. um, you pastored for 30 years and mm -hmm. 25 of those was with him and the yes. latter five without him. Um, mm -hmm. And from what I remember, you stepped into that pastoral role not even 30 days uh, after his, um, his burial. Um, how did you pull it together uh, and were able to step into that leadership role? So. I, I, I knew it had to be God because I didn't believe I could do that. And so uh, the plan was we were going to have a church meeting and we we're going to do all of that. Um, but at the funeral, at Bishop's funeral, at my late husband's funeral, uh, the bishop gets up in the middle of the funeral and says, and now we're going to appoint Valerie Bennett as the pastor, so you're pastor of House of Prayer. So I'm sitting on the front row wow. grieving, and everybody is applauding. Oh and I'm like, but what about the meeting? What about the discussion? Wow. We, we, didn't, we didn't even discuss this, but I was the co-pastor. And he says, well, it's only fitting that you, you continue on mm. as the senior pastor. And so it was really a kind of a surprise because I hadn't planned it that way. 
But uh, I knew God was with me, and I didn't think I missed and loved him so much. I thought I would just cry and be laid on the floor uh, screaming and hollering, and I thought I would never be able to walk through the doors of the church again because it was so heavy. But I learned, and I, I found out so much more about God, how the scripture says he'll give you peace that surpasses all understanding. And I tell you, that peace came over me in a way that I had never experienced it before. So his funeral was on that, uh, homegoing was that Monday. And that Wednesday, I was teaching Bible class wow. two days later. And that Sunday, and it just continued wow. on. There was no break. There was no time to grieve. And I believe it's what I needed. It, it caused me to stay in the word of God stay at the feet of God, stay in his presence. And that helped me over that difficult time in my life, spending more and more time with the Lord. Wow. Well, for all of us, uh, Bishop's um, uh, death was, 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 was very hard. Um, I'm just curious, as his wife, did he ever have a heart to heart with you as to what he wanted in the event that he was not here anymore? He talked about certain things, uh, but he didn't talk about that leadership as far as senior pastor. So he shared so many things as we look back to prepare us for this day. Uh, and so we smile and laugh, you know, <laughs> like uh, at the funeral home, they said, well, do you know what cemetery? I mean, in all of his happy days, he always talked about this day. Wow. And it seems really strange. And maybe he knew because he was so spontaneous. Uh, where I'm a planner, you know, I, ABC, one, two, three, <laughs> you know, we have to write it down and we long-term, short-term goals. And we would do that. And he would just get up the next day and just like that, change everything. It's like, wait a minute. But I, it was as if maybe he knew mm -hmm. that he didn't have long mm -hmm. and he taught me so much about life. Seize the day, mm -hmm. you know, make the most of this day. So as, as we look at that, I believe he prepared us in things he did set in place as having me as the co-pastor, not just in title, but because God had really truly anointed me to do what he had called me to do. Speaking of pastor, there are, there are so many who have an issue with women in leadership, be mm -hmm. it pastor, politician, CEO. Mm -hmm. uh, as a woman who has, in my opinion, led with excellence, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I believe God calls who he calls. And when we look through scriptures, we see that he used women often as well. And I just happen to be one of those women. And I think when I begin to read in the book of Judges where he talks about Deborah, uh, it talks about how village life had ceased until I, Deborah, arose a mother in Zion. So I believe there are times when that motherly love and uh, capacity that God has put in us is needed in our cities, mm -hmm. in, in our workplace. Of course, it's needed in the home. It's needed in the church. And it's something that innately God has endowed us with. Mm -hmm. and, and when Deborah arose, she was a prophetess. She was a judge. But it didn't talk about that. Mm -hmm. She said, I arose a mother in Zion. Mm. And I believe there's something that women add Absolutely. that is so, so special and precious that is needed among people. And sometimes we don't know how to put it in words, yeah. but it's something about a mother's love. Mm. When, when Deborah rose up as that leader, uh, the military was able to go out to battle. Life continued. Village life began to blossom. And she didn't take uh, anything from the authority of the men. She didn't diminish that at all. She added it and she spoke life into them that they could rise up and accomplish the things that God had called them to do. Wow. So they, they led together. Yeah. And I think sometimes that's what women have the ability to do. We were designed to be the help meet. So even in our leadership role, we still know where we stand and yeah. we know how to lead to bring everyone together not to 
uh, make the man look like he's less than, mm. but to cause him to stand up and rise to who he's to be too. Yes, yes, yes. And so I, I, I think it's a beautiful thing. So I don't mind being called Mother Bennett. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. Yes, yes, yes. So, so I am a mother in Zion, yes. and, and that is just such a wonderful office. And in the leadership that God has given us as women in these days and time, I think it's beautiful. And I think it's adding to families, businesses, churches, and it's causing them to even increase, multiply, and just be blessed in a a unique way because it's what's needed in this season. Wow. You mentioned being a helpmate and and, uh, not taking away from the man, but adding to. You were a pastor for 30 years, but married close to 40. Mm -hmm. Uh, Help Mm -hmm. our uh, young wives and and (laughs) women who want to be wives someday. How do they support a man with great vision? Mm, Well, one bishop told me, he says, your job is to be the intercessor. Mm. So as he casts vision, you put legs to it. Mm. So we're like incubators. So in the natural, as the man plants the seed, we incubate it Mm -hmm. and we cause it to grow. And then when the right time, it gives birth. So he can go on and do even greater things because somebody is there caring and nurturing the vision that he cast. So she doesn't have to cast it, but as he casts it, she knows how to cause us to run with the vision. And we put legs to it and administrate and cause it to go forth. So in marriage, it's, it's the same way. Uh, he's the head, and it's okay if you're the neck. Mm-hmm. So sometimes you just have to <laughs> just <turn. laughs> help the head turn where mm-hmm. it needs to go, and you don't have to usurp authority, mm-hmm. but you can honor him as the head and the leader, and the two of you work together. That's so beautiful. You um, pastored for 30 years, married close to 40, and mm-hmm. now you came to the place where you said, I believe it's time to go. Uh, I have to retire and move on to what God has for me. But you're still so young. And we we see pastors now who who pastor for 60, 70 years. You know, you have to almost put them out the pulpit. (laughs) What how did this come come about? Well, I've always been sensitive to the voice of God. And so, sure, this was 30 years that I've been in this capacity uh, of leading in, in ministry. And I heard the Lord say 30 and out. And so I wasn't quite sure how he wanted that to take place. But uh, in 2019, it was the 30th year. We started in 1989 at the dining room table, and I've watched what God has done. But every time we obeyed his voice, Mm. oh, my goodness, it's something about timing. It's it's not just... uh, uh, Slow obedience is almost disobedience. Mm, That's good. You know, when we're slow to move on what we've heard from God. So I said, I know I need quick obedience to to follow what I heard. And so I told my son, I said, this is my last year. And I brought him closer, um, Elder Stephen Bennett, to walk closer with me because I was going to hand the baton over to him. So as God began to speak that, we began to put things in line to prepare for this day. So uh, January, I turned 62. And so I said, well, God, this is so fitting. This is the time that many do retire. So I've retired as the senior pastor, but I would never retire from being a preacher yes. of the gospel. That's right. I That's always right. preach and I still have my calendar for this year. <laughs> That's right. Places I'm going and uh, just to share the word of God and to do what he's called me to do. Uh, but uh, so I want to die empty, mm-hmm. you know, so sometimes we feel God calls us to something. And that's the only thing mm. that he's given into our hands. Yes. But we see that there's more. There's so much potential. There's so much gifts and uh, things that God has placed inside of us. And so a uh, senior pastor is a title. It's an appointment. But a calling on your life. It is for life. Yes. And yes. that's what I received. Wow. Wow. You mentioned turning the baton over to uh, Pastor Steve, who uh-huh. I am uh, <laughs> so proud of. Just 
just to see him grow and, and blossom in this thing is mm-hmm. just beautiful. I can only imagine what it is for you as the mom and uh, pastor. Wow. How does that feel for you? It, it brings tears to my eyes uh, because I have five daughters and one son. So he is truly my number one son. <laughs> <laughs> and as a, as a child, as a baby, he always, he would grab anything and it was his microphone and he'd be preaching around the house and, and mimicking his father all the time. And so I thought maybe he would be a preacher. And then he grew up and was like, ah, no, thank you. Mm-hmm. And he, he had no interest in it. And then God did that thing. And he accepted his calling. And uh, to see him Sunday after Sunday when I sit there and watch him, yeah. he reminds me so much of his father. Yes. And yeah. I know that I did the right thing. I know I heard the right thing from God. Because sometimes we can put our children in positions because they are children and we want to force them and make them and prop them up to look like they're the one that is called by God. And to see God's hand truly on him Mm -hmm. and to see the ministry grow, to see the people receive him the way Mm -hmm. they have done has just been, uh, it it, it has just been so amazing for me because After doing something for 30 years, the last thing you want to do is to miss God and to retire and the church crumble and fall apart and and say, why did I do that? But when it's God's timing, it's Mm. God's timing. And the blessing is on him and on me. And and I'm excited. I told him it's easier to follow than to lead. So he don't have to worry. I'm at church. I'm on time. And when I'm running late, I'm like, Pastor, I'm on my way. Here I come. <laughs> and I call him. And you know, Pastor, is it okay? I have engagement. They've asked me to speak. Is it okay with you? You know. And so we have so much fun yes. with this role reversal. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I tell, I call him through the week. Is there anything I can help you with? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I don't want you to be overworked. I want you to have time in the face of God. And if there are any busy things that other people can do, mm-hmm. I can help with that. Yeah. Even though I'm not the senior pastor, I know ministry. Yeah. And so uh, he gives me his own little assignments. <laughs> <Yeah>. and, <laughs> So we have these little assignments and I call in and like, okay, completed. I did what you asked of me, Pastor. Is there anything else? And so uh, I remember the first Sunday we switched seats in the pulpit. Mm -hmm. We came up and we were going to our regular seats and we looked at each other and we switched seats and we were like, like the three little bears. (laughs) This chair doesn't feel right. And he didn't like my chair and I didn't like his. My chair swiveled. And and I was accustomed to that. Mm-hmm. And he's like, this old chair, the first <laughs> thing we're going to do is buy new chairs. <laughs> and so I love it that we can mm-hmm. enjoy the journey mm-hmm. and enjoy the transition. And um, him to know that this is what God has called him yes. to do and still smile and not just I want to make dad proud or I want to make mom proud. But most of all, I want to be in the will of God and I want to make God proud. Yes, yes. That's the key. Speaking of enjoying the journey, you have a new book, A Joyful Journey, which is a 30 day devotional to add more joy to your life. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine the work that came in and all the toiling you had to do to get here. Tell us the title. Uh, being that, that that we go through so much in in, in life, um, mm. why did you title a joyful journey versus peaceful or faithful <laughs> or why a joyful journey? Well, the book is written by four authors: Bishop Bennett, my late husband. He was fun. He loved life, and he showed you how to have joy in any situation mm. that you came into. And I believe when he was diagnosed with cancer, uh, people would come in and want to pray for him and bought him special water and special this and that. And he was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I I serve God. And it takes God just as much power to keep me alive as it does for him to heal me. Mm. And if I'm not healed, then this is his will for me and we're just going to enjoy it. Mm. And so we learned how to enjoy uh, that time. And he had written uh, days of devotions. And then even my brother was diagnosed with cancer. 
and both of them had started writing this book wow. before their diagnosis. And my brother was one that was a writer. He always saw the glass half full instead of half empty. And so he had joy. And then my daughter, Myra, she was yeah. a drama major. So she's going to make you laugh. Mm -hmm. She's going to have some fun. So when I begin to think about all of the authors mm -hmm. coming together, but me being the black and white, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the task oriented person, the kind of person that I say, wow, look at this journey they have taken me through mm -hmm. or allowed me to travel along with them on. It has been nothing but a joyful journey, wow. even through sickness. I think about our wedding vows. And on that day, you know, when we got married in 1977, it says, you know, for richer, for poor, you know, mm -hmm. in sickness and in health, you know, uh, for better or for worse. And it's like you just say, I do, because you're thinking about the joy in the journey. Yeah. But as you walk through marriage, Mm, yeah. It's not as joyful yeah. <laughs> as you think. As you walk along with Christ, your days aren't always as joyful. But if we can find the joy, yeah. I love the scripture in Nehemiah 8 and 10. It says, for the joy of the Lord yes. is your strength. And so when I begin to think about what helped me through those hard times, what helped them through those hard times, it had to be joy. Yeah. And joy is part of the fruit of the spirit. First it starts love and then it goes to joy. So we know how important love is and joy has to be next right there. Yeah. And so when I thought about that, um, I said, okay, we'll call it a joyful journey. Mm. And so I began to take these 30 days that they had written mm -hmm. and I tried to lay them out in a way and say, God, how are they connected? And so when I talked to uh, my graphic designer, he says, so what you want to focus on is the journey. And I said, no, I want to focus on the joy. Yes. And he said, but you calling it a joyful journey. So actually the journey is going to lead you to the joy. Wow. And wow. I said, really? Okay. That makes sense. So the byproduct of the journey is joy. Mm. And so the byproduct of what we receive in this life through our journeys is that joy. Yeah. And when we can't find it individually in our personal daily life, we find it in the Lord. And so I just said, okay, it's going to be a joyful journey. 30 days of adding more joy to the joy you already have. Yes, I love mm -hmm. it. I love it. You opened the book with a quote um, from Bishop Randy Borders. <laughs> Today, I am positioning myself in a position called ready. Mm, mm. I have been getting ready too long. Wow. What does that, that quote mean to you? Well, to me, um, I've been writing this book for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and um, to think that they had started writing this book and then we had put it together. And uh, it's been ready. Mm. I've been getting ready. And after... They passed away, uh, my brother and my late husband. Uh, I was still getting ready, getting ready, getting ready. You know, I've been getting ready for too long, but I positioned myself that this is the year, this is the time that this book is going to get published. Yeah. So there are times that we put off till tomorrow what we need to do today. I was grieving. I was crying. It, it was always an excuse. But God put something in my spirit that I've been getting ready too long now. Mm. Today. Yeah. Today yeah. is the day that I'm ready. I'm ready for this next place. And this book is actually the door to the rest of me. And I didn't I didn't realize it. I thought it was crossing something off the list, completing a task that I had started. But God was trying to open mm. the door to the rest of me. Mm -hmm. This me that had been married 37 years mm -hmm. to now this new door of being single. Mm -hmm. Wow, what is that <laughs> like? <laughs> this door yeah, where I had yeah. served God in the capacity of pastor. Now I'm pastor emerita or retired pastor. What is that like? 
So 2020, this year, is the opening of the door wow. to the rest of me. Wow, I love it. I love it. <laughs> you, you, you hit something so profound. You said getting ready. And I think I just want to give our listeners a little bit more there because there's so many people who uh, have so many dreams and goals mm -hmm. and they're always feeling like they're trying to get up on the next leg. Like, I can't quite get myself together. Um, what would you say to those individuals that that have the dream, have the vision, but they just can't seem to get themselves positioned? How, how should they start that process? Well, I know I've heard the, the saying that if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. So I understand preparation and I understand getting ready. But then there comes a time where you have to do it afraid. Yeah. You know, because it, sometimes we can become such a perfectionist. And, oh, it's not good enough. Uh, even with the book, I, I had it, you know, get ready, send it to print. No, mark it up, change this, move that. But it had to come to that day where I said, print it. You, you have to come to that day that you say, do it. So you dream, then you dare, then you do. Mm. So you, you have the vision, you have the dream. It's wonderful. Now, taking that leap of faith to do it, to write I, I preach, but to write and put my life and my personal feelings on paper, I'm not good at that because I'm private. And so when you begin to write and when you begin to do what God has given you to do, some of those things we've been doing all of our life in the private. But now God is opening up the door and yeah. wants you to share your gift to the world. Yeah. Because truly that's why he gave it to you, not just for you. I didn't realize how many people needed this book. I ordered 500 because I was very, very, I was pushed to the edge. <laughs> and because I think numbers and finances is cheaper if you buy more too, yeah, right? Yeah, you yeah. Know? <laughs> so I ordered 500 copies and like, oh my God, how am I going to sell this? And, and I, I've sold 450 copies wow. of this book already wow. you know and it it has really really been amazing but i had to dare to jump out and what my late husband bishop bennett taught me is that when god gives you something just do it and i think after we had been married for a while i would scare him because <laughs> at first he would just dream every day he had a new dream oh Val, what about this let's buy up wyoming let's do this i mean he had big dreams all the time and he lived to see so many of them come to pass and i'd be saying okay well what about this and mm -hmm. what about that and oh Val, come on we, we would go out of town and we're driving and he had no directions <laughs> How do you think we're going to get there? Oh, don't worry about it. We'll just call somebody. I mean, the way he did life, he would just leap at the dream and it would come to pass. Some may call it foolishness, but sometimes that's what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and evidence of things not seen. You don't see it. You're hoping for it. And your dream, if you're going to do the big dream that God has put in inside of you, you have to do it now. Yeah, yeah. Because one day you wake up and you're like me, you're 62 years old. And so much of your life has already passed away, yeah, you know, yeah. and then you don't want to. I wish I could have should have. Mm -hmm. But I believe uh, I have learned that there's joy in the journey. It's not about the destination as much as it is about the journey what you learn along the way. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned uh, the butterflies, and we see it, see those here on the cover um, <laughs> and the apparel that you have. Yes. Uh, what's the significance of the butterflies to this journey? Well, the butterflies are, are, are so key. Uh, my graphic designer said, when you hear the title, what do you see? A joyful journey. I'm like, oh, okay, sitting by the water, and I see the movement of the water. That's a journey or a pathway. But the more I thought about it, I thought of butterflies. Because a butterfly doesn't start off a butterfly. There's a journey or a metamorphosis yes. that takes place. And I saw joy like that. It, it, it starts uh, as a lava. It, it can start uh, small like a caterpillar on the ground. But what the caterpillar sees is the butterfly one day. And then it goes through the cocoon stage. 
which it could be a stage where you're all alone. It's dark. It looks like it's never going to happen. Uh, the joy that you talk about, you actually don't feel it. You've gone from this stage and this place on the journey. But then, oh, that one day. Yeah, yeah. You see that beautiful insect, that beautiful butterfly that didn't start off that way. It comes out. It has vibrant colors. Yeah. It has matching wings, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a moth. If you look at a moth, it has wings, but it's dull colored. <laughs> it's ugly, dark. Ugly. <laughs> ugly. <laughs> Nobody likes those. And joy is, is, is totally opposite. Joy, it comes with something that makes you smile. Mm -hmm. it, they're so delicate, but they're seen during the day. Mm -hmm. They're seen in the sun. And I believe what God has given us when we're excited about what God has given us, it lights up any room. Yeah. It gets everyone's attention. It's very gentle. It's not pushy. It's not arrogant. Mm. And so when he first did my cover, they were reaching for something, but it was nothing there. Mm. And that was supposed to be the joy. And I said, no, no, no. I, I need butterflies. Yeah. So he went back and he put butterflies I throughout the book. And I think of my life evolving from place to place to place along the journey to cause me to have the joy I have today. You know, the uh, old folks used to sing the song, this joy that I have, yeah. the, the world <laughs> didn't give it, it to me. Yeah. <laughs> the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away because my journey has showed me so much mm. throughout my life. They can't nobody take that away from me. Wow. That when I think of certain things, all I can do is smile, yeah. you know, because I thought it would be the death of me. Or, you know, the enemy has you against a rock and a hard place and a wall and a place where there is no hope. And some way, somehow, God always shows up. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> he has always in 37 years of marriage. He always showed up with all of those kids when the bills were tall and the money was small. Guess what? He smiled on us and we still had ice cream. <laughs> we still had an Oreo cookie. I mean, <laughs> I don't know how he would do what he does, but he said, I came that your joy might be full. Yeah. He said, I want you to have joy that's unspeakable mm. and full of glory because happiness depends on what happens to you. But joy comes from the inside. Wow. It's an inside work. So I wanted to create a book that would uh, enhance each day with reflections from the Bible, encouraging words, and then a prayer. Just something simple, something small that you can read every day that kind of jumpstart your day. Yes. And I believe after 30 days of this journey, you'll have a new outlook on life. And those times of reflections that I offer in the book will cause you to put a pin in it and think about something that'll make you smile. Wow. Wow. You mentioned this is a 30 day journal. Um, and at the time of this recording, that would put us at day 18. OK. Which is faith to help others. Mm -hmm. And you, you right here. We hear a lot of talk about how our faith brings salvation, deliverance joy, and even prosperity to our lives. Mm -hmm. But it is time to also focus on using our faith to help impact the lives of others. Expound on that. Faith to help others. I think this is Matthew 8 and 8 was one of the scriptures. They needed help from Jesus. Mm -hmm. And when he came to Jesus, he said, you can just send your word. And sometimes it's a word that mm -hmm. we can send. Yeah. It's, it's a smile. It's, it's time in our day. Even the four men that tore the, tore the roof off the building because their friend was sick mm -hmm. and laid him in front of Jesus. Sometimes we need somebody else mm -hmm. to help get us to the joy that we need. And sometimes we can be self-centered. You know, salvation, uh, save yourself. You yeah, know, you yeah, got to do that yeah, yourself. Yeah. You know, pull, pull your own self up by your own bootstraps. I think there's a place for that. But then there's a time where we need to be not just a handout, but a hand up mm -hmm. in helping others get to that place. Mm -hmm. So I think our faith, he doesn't save us just so we can be saved. 
He doesn't save us just so we can go to heaven. But the whole thing is we're a body of Christ yes. that we bring somebody else along, that our faith needs to connect with somebody else's faith. And I think that's what our faith does, faith to help somebody else. Wow. Speaking of helping somebody else, being a pastor of 30 years, how can the pew better mm-hmm. serve the pulpit? Because so many times we put so many emphasis on the leader, the pastor. Oh, you didn't do this. You got to go here. You got to do that. How can we better serve uh, uh, our leaders in our local church? Well, I believe accountability goes both ways. And so a pastor, of course, is accountable to the congregation. And uh, there are certain responsibilities that only a pastor handles in a ministry. But those in the congregation, they can be helpful from the pews by, number one, receive the word that's preached from the pastor, uh, support with their tithes, their talent, and their time. Mm -hmm. If they would give back and become this team, uh, if they would be prayerful and pray for the leadership and pray for uh, the man or woman of God that leads them, it, it, it all is so helpful, just small steps mm-hmm. in teaming up to help uh, and speak well of your church. Sometimes, you know, we go home from service and, and there are things that happen and our loved ones or our coworkers hear these negative things that we're saying about our church. Mm-hmm. And then on Family and Friends Day, we say, come good with me to <laughs> yeah, church. I ain't and they say, I'm not coming over there because your <laughs> church has this and this is going on. And who would want to come to that church? So we have to be careful mm-hmm. how we even speak about the challenging times when there are times where uh, things are not the way we reveal, we feel they should be at church. That's the time where we really have to kind of calm it down and just really go on our knees and pray because people are listening. Church, they need help. You know, people say, well, they want it to be the spiritual side. And they say, well, church just wants your money. And I say, well, the mall wants your money. Mm. McDonald's wants your money. (laughs) The car dealership. I mean, it takes money to do business. It, It just takes money to do ministry. But there's so much more the church has to offer. So when you give your money and you support the church, that helps in so many ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a feeding program. And in order to feed, you you need money to get the food to feed the people, mm-hmm. to do missions overseas. You need to send money. Yeah. Uh, so there's so many things when families are in need and they come to the church. Often they need help money to help yeah. pay gas bills and different things like that. So uh, the money needs to be there and your financial support of your local church goes a long way. If everyone would do 10% and give to their church, the church would lack nothing. Yeah. But the reason they have so many fundraisers and building from projects <laughs> is because the giving is down, yeah. you know, I think studies show that only 20% of the congregation pays tithes. Wow. And most people think oh, all of that money the church has, and they don't realize that the church doesn't have as much money as they think they do because it costs so much to do ministry. Mm-hmm. So the money that comes in is spent so you can have lights and gas and mm-hmm. toilet paper in the bathroom. Right. I mean, soap. I mean, you know, someone to help clean. I mean, so monies truly are spent, but you want to have enough that you can do ministry as well. So one way to help, those are a few ways to help, mm-hmm. but uh, love on your pastor, love one another in the pews, not just the just pastor, but love one another. Yeah. And I think that's our slogan. Experience the love and, and love, love the experience. experience. That's, right. that's that's how you can really help. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. You, you said so much and I want to <laughs> go so... <laughs> go, go. No, no, no. It's good. No, no. You, it was good. Because it made me think about... Uh, you were speaking about the pastor and helping the pastor and then you talked about uh, giving and tithing. And this may not be a good segue, but there are so many that um, have issue with prosperous pastors or preacher, mm. preachers. Mm. And I know that's that's uh, aside from the, the, the stuff we've heard in the news mm-hmm. and media, mm-hmm. but I'm one that I feel like I want my leader to be prosperous. Mm-hmm. But there's so many who have issues with that. What, 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 what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, 
I believe, uh, I believe this is, is the third John that said, I would that you prosper mm -hmm. and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. And I believe God wants that for us. And to be a representative of a royal priesthood in first Peter two and nine, it says, but you are a chosen generation, mm -hmm. you know, a royal priesthood. What better way to show off our father, yeah. the king of kings, the Lord of lords, part of this royal family than having something in the earth. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people don't think we're going to get it till we get to heaven. But that's a whole nother life. Yes, we, we're not going to yes. need cars and houses up there. <laughs> we, heaven on earth. we need heaven <laughs> right here on earth. I believe there's a balance. I think we can overdo it. Mm -hmm. But some sometimes people look at us and they don't know what we had before we get, came right. and gave our life to the Lord. Right. If If the pastor has been a good steward mm -hmm. and has done well with the monies that they have received and the things that they have in life, those things would take them a long way. Right. So when you see me, and I've been doing this for 30 years, I should have some. at least one or something, some. a designer <laughs> bag, a pair of shoes or something. At 62 years old, That's if right. I've been working every day, every week, I should have something. Mm -hmm. I should have a nice home, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but don't just judge me for where you see me where I am. Mm -hmm. You don't know the journey. You don't know the journey. And all the sacrifice, as we give, it's given to us. And there's so many things that I have in my life that I didn't pay for. Mm. They were given to me. Mm. I've given away fur coats. I've given away designer bags. I just... Cars. I, cars. Yes, I mean, yes, we, yes. our church is giving away houses. Yeah. I mean, we are giving people. And the Bible says, if we give, it should be given to us. How? Press yes. down, shake it together, yeah. and running over, what? Shall men give unto your bosom? So when you see the prosperity of the preacher, don't just think he's taking it out of the offering. Mm -hmm. But our Father yes. is where our, our blessings and our income and everything that comes in our life comes from him. Yeah. And, and, and so I get so excited because I just... I just know it's God. Mm -hmm. I said, I, I, I've never had a lot of money, but I had a big God. Yeah. And man, he keep me looking good. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's he right. keeps me looking good. And I want the children of God to look good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I want them to look good and reflect this God that we serve. The joyful journey. Uh, at the end, you have reflections for mm -hmm. the reader to kind of reflect on the different days. And one of those, you say, share an instance uh, in which obedience to God resulted in great joy. I'm going to ask that of you. Share an instance <laughs> where your obedience resulted Ooh, in great joy. An instance where obedience resulted in great joy. Um, I think one, uh, one thing that comes to mind is our ministry was a, a year old. And my pastor, my late husband, Bishop, said, I want you to do a women's conference. Mm. <laughs> I had never been to a women's conference. <laughs> we only had a handful of people, but my obedience to my pastor and to the voice of the Lord caused us to take our first women's conference out of the country wow. over to Canada. I didn't have a team. I didn't have a musician. I just had a few ladies at the church. I, I didn't know what I was doing. But I, I sought God and the Holy Spirit would speak to me every day. So we're walking down the hallway at the hotel, going to the meeting room. And they said, OK, Pastor Val, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know yet. God hasn't spoken. And they like, are you for real? I mean, for real, you do not <laughs> you're know. At the venue. You're like, hold on. I am at the venue and I had no clue. And sure enough, we went in and I'd say, OK, call this person up. Well, do they know I'm calling them? I said, no, they don't know. <laughs> But trust me, and I'm telling you, we depended so much mm. on the Holy Spirit, our obedience to his voice. Uh, I had them put a piano in the room. I didn't even have a musician. <laughs> they said, who's going to play? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> we started service. A lady out of the audience just got up, played for us the whole wow. weekend. <laughs> wow. And I, I mean, every day I saw the blessings of the Lord through pure obedience of trust in the Holy Spirit. We raised great money to take care of everything. 
And after that, we were known for having one of the most awesome women's wonderful weekend Bible conferences. Mm. People are still asking yes. me today, when are we going to have our next one? And it was because of that obedience. And it has always brought me great joy mm. that I obeyed the voice of God, even though I didn't have a clue what I was doing, but I have no regrets for that journey. Wow. For those that want to know, because I, I know some personally that <laughs> ask, uh, is there a possibility it will re make a return, Women's Wonderful Weekend? Yes, yes. I still have mini been in ministries and still going on, uh, as well as House of Prayer and Praise, and I'm going to talk to my pastor. <laughs> <laughs> talk to my pastor, but I have been uh, doing site business already uh, uh, with some properties to see uh, I would like to go out of town, but it may be a little closer to home, maybe four hours radius or drive. Mm -hmm. But yes, there will be another Women's Wonderful Weekend All Bible right. Conference. You guys yes. heard it here first. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Wow. Well, Pastor Brown, we can go on and on, but let our uh, listeners and viewers know where they can purchase the book again. Well, you can go to my website, and that is www.valeriebennett, that's V A L O R I E B E N N E T, that's valeriebennett.com. And I have my uh, joyful journey uh, line there for my apparel as well as the book. The book retails for $20. I'd love to put that in your hand. Um, you can cash app. I have PayPal, different <laughs> ways uh, of paying. Uh, you can cash app. Uh, the dollar sign Kingdom Bennett and just send me uh, your information. I can put it in the mail, go to the website or stop by here at the church at House of Prayer and Praise at 16520 Wyoming in the city of Detroit. And after any of our services, you're welcome to pick up your copy or your apparel right here at our church. Yes, yes. We're getting ready to close, but just before we go, for those that may be... Um on their journey and maybe in, in the process of something that may not just be, it may not be joyful, they may not bring their heart joy. Uh, encourage them, how should they take this next step in their journey? Well, I, I love this one scripture that says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Yeah. And, and I love that verse because it used the word may. It doesn't have to last. It may last all night. But it depends on how you maintain that nighttime yeah. in your life. So the way you maintain your nighttime will determine how long that weeping mm, that's endures. Good. That's good. Because joy is coming. Joy truly is coming. So I want to encourage you to maintain your nighttime and reflect on the things of God. Think of all the things that he has for you that he'll give you that peace and that joy and just pray unto God. He said, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open to you. I believe joy is on the other side of that door yes. waiting for you. Yes. Well, a joyful journey with Pastor Valerie Bennett. Thank you so much, Pastor Val, for you joining welcome. me. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. Well, this has been the Build on Beauty podcast where beauty is born skin deep. I'm your host, <laughs> Cornell Germain. Until next time, let your soul be made whole. Take Good. care. Thank you for listening to the Build on Beauty podcast. For more information about our host, please visit CornellGermain.com.